of our hearts be always pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please take a seat. <clears throat> Today I want to focus on the gospel passage, but uh, there's some themes that run through. So our Old Testament passage from Jeremiah and even Paul's letter to Timothy have some themes and ideas that run through. And the first thing we need to understand is the relationship that the Jewish people had to Samaritans. Now, growing up in South Africa uh, during the apartheid era, there were some fairly clear, sharp distinctions drawn. And I was privileged because I was white. Uh, and then there were sort of blacks and there were colored people which is essentially uh, historically in their, in their family history some white ancestry, some black ancestry there were Indians and then there were others which mostly meant people of Asian descent and I remember talking to someone sort of after apartheid had officially ended who, who was coloured coloured ancestry bit of black, bit of white. And it was interesting because he said it's during the apartheid era we weren't white enough. And now that apartheid's finished we're not black enough. It's like, <laughs> it's a bit harsh, a bit rough on them. Um, it was a fair comment too. Uh, so what's that got to do? Well the Samaritans are in a similar sense to, to that. Um, when the Babylonians came in and uh, sacked Jerusalem, they took off all the, the educated class. But that left behind the peasants. And the peasants uh, recreated their faith. But they didn't have all the, the educated class there to kind of help them. So picture... Picture those of us who aren't farmers trying to recreate modern farming from what we've seen on a bit of telly. We know it's important because it provides food, but pretty much we're ignorant, or at least I am. So they, they did what they could with the knowledge that they had. And they also they interbred with the, the pagans, the non-Jews. And so the Samaritans, by the time after the exile have returned, the, the faithful Jewish people Remember, these are the, the ones that went off into exile. And interestingly, in exile, they became more faithful. That often happens, doesn't it? When somebody's trying to stamp out the faith, it just becomes more firmly and deeply entrenched in people. They come back, and there's now a class of people living around Jerusalem that are mixed heritage, not Jewish enough to be Jewish, not pagan enough to be pagan. They, uh, they don't quite have the faith right. They followed the Torah, but not everything else. They built a temple on a separate mountain, away from the temple in Jerusalem. So when the Jews got back, there's this group of people that, that they despised. Because they were nearly, but not quite. And into this circumstance comes Jesus. And we've got this story, we've got a couple of others. Uh, the story of the Good Samaritan. Which has become so ubiquitous that we just use the name for a person who's nice. And we don't understand the impact of the story. And Jesus is walking along the border between Samaria and Galilee. And that geography is significant. This is the border that cro between those who are right and those who are wrong. It's a lesson there. And in their despair and in their 
brokenness and in their trouble, all those old barriers are broken down. And we've got 10 people with leprosy. Now, nowadays, we can treat leprosy. Uh, but back then, it was a very different kettle of fish. And they've formed a small community of lepers. And one of them originally comes from Samaria. And they come to Jesus, and uh, they don't come too close because they've got leprosy. It's highly contagious. Nobody wants to get close to them. And they call out for help. Then he caught in a storm. And Jesus sends them to go and be checked. And one comes back to thank him, the Samaritan. And we, we, we know the conversation, weren't all ten made better, and one comes back, the Samaritan. And Jesus says, rise and go, your faith has made you well. Remember, the, his faith is the wrong faith. His faith doesn't match what all the Jewish people have been told matters the most. So once again, Jesus is pointing us to something that might be a little bit awkward for a lot of people. That it's not necessarily what you believe in your head that matters so much before God. But how you respond and what you do. So the faith that Jesus is proclaiming is not an intellectual place. Which is hard for me to say because I love the intellectual stuff. It's an active place. It's what you do. It's how you respond to those in need. That's a challenge for a lot of people who are confident that their head picture of God is right. And sometimes what that translates to is a lack of doing what is right. So that's the first lesson. The second thing, though, is, well, then why do we worry about what's going on in our heads? Why do we worry about, after the sermon, we're going to say the creed? This statement of what Christians believe. Why do we bother? Why do we bother with Bible studies? Getting together and discussing. In the Anglican Church, why do we say before you can be a priest, you've got to go off and do a theology degree? I mean, it's fine, but we also make it mandatory. Why do we do that? I think it's because we're elite athletes. I know, I look just like an elite athlete, don't I? <laughs> I look more like a ten pin in a 10-pin bowling tournament, but anyway. We're elite athletes. Now, if you think about elite athletes like um, Usain Bolt, and uh, there's a lot in there. It's, it's profoundly physical what they do, isn't it? And, and, and emotional. When they're on that running track or, or uh, when the... When the team goes out onto the field to play with the footy or whatever it is they're playing, it's physical and it's emotional. But they get off the field and they've got a doctor and a nutritionist and, a, and these people and they strap little LEDs to their legs and, and they examine it because they want to be better at it. They don't want to just run for the, you know, based purely on the kind of the, the emotion of it. They want to be better at it. And so they bring the head stuff into the game as well. And we are elite athletes in the kingdom of God. We have a responsibility to, to do what we do with passion. To reach out our hands and to do good as Christ did. But we want to do it the best we can. And so we bring the science to it. The science of exploring the nature of God. So that when we do it, we can do it that little bit better. That little bit 
more passionately, more faithfully to the nature of God. Because if you want to run fast, really fast, you want to run like Usain Bolt. If you want to do faith really well, really well, applied Christianity, you want to do it like Jesus Christ. And what do we know about him? Quite a lot, actually. But we know he prayed, he thought, he acted with compassion. He had his eyes on God and his hands buried in the muck of the world to do the best for others. So our call is to be elite athletes. Elite athletes, the kingdom of God. In the name of Christ, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.